Okay, an update for progress at the moment. Um, I won't mention the bike too much, I'll do a separate film for that. I'm just waiting for some parts, then I can assemble the forks. I've got various bits sitting in Evaporust or having paint stripped off them. And I've been cleaning up the, the rims. I've just been doing that manually. And I've got various bits painted. Uh, like sprocket and air filter cleaner. Um, this is kind of all overlapping projects. I put the headliner back in the Land Rover and I've left it parked outside because one, now it doesn't leak and two, I wanted to see what happens with this new glue when it gets up to temperature and I've had temperatures up to, I think the highest I've seen is 57 degrees C, 59 degrees C in here and the new headlining is holding up really well hasn't started to sag, the glue hasn't come soft uh, so that's actually pretty nice uh, because I've been painting various parts and I've had parts painted by the sandblaster because this is enamel paint it helps if you can sort of bake it on a bit so I thought well I might as well combine these two things and I've had the parts sitting in the back of the landy cooking basically um, it does smell a little bit solventy <laughs> bit painty but actually that's not as bad as it was so it's definitely helping um, dry out the paints so that's quite good there's no rush to reassemble things I think I'll get as much cleaned up as possible and then assemble it all at the end which is good because it lets the paint get nice and hard so that's the landy so Riley I'm still waiting for some parts uh, they're on the way I think they're in America at the moment and I need to start thinking about bolting the body down. Once I've finished shaping it, I'll bolt the frame to the chassis. I may need to order some bolts to do that. Um, uh, I really don't want to use metric ones, but uh, I'll figure out what I'm going to do there. I can at least temporarily drill bolts. So if I use, say, 8mm bolts, that's 5 16th BSF, I can get those later. Uh, but the thing I've been playing with today doing a little bit of electronics type stuff is figuring out how I'm going to drive the rev counter on this thing so it's magneto drive doesn't have a distributor there is a mechanical takeoff but I don't have a mechanical gauge um, so I've mentioned these before these are the really cheap they're like five bucks each little rev counter things you can get off eBay or Aliexpress uh, they work reasonably well and I had played with reverse engineering the circuit on that and using that to drive a microcontroller um, to get the the number of pulses and I didn't have much luck there as it was a bit too sensitive I think to electronic noise um, so I was trying to think is there a simpler more reliable way I could do this and the idea I came up with and this might be a terrible, terrible idea. Uh, there may be a reason why I haven't been able to find anyone else doing it this way. Might be because it doesn't work. But I have managed to get it working so far. And that's to use a, uh, a neon indicator bulb. So those are um, the little orange lamps that you get on mains powered devices. They've been around for years and years and years. I think over 100 years and um, they need a high voltage at least 90 volts to make them spark uh, make them light up so what i ended up doing is using one of those uh, it's hidden inside here and that's sitting on top of a light sensor so one of the problems with these sort of circuits is if you try to connect anything directly to the ignition one it's high voltage and it'll zap things and kill electronics and two there's a lot of electrical noise so what I'm trying to do here is isolate the um, electrical sides of the circuit. So I just have a clip lead going to one of the spark plug terminals to the neon lamp and then have the other end grounded, just grounded down to the battery here. And basically what that means is every time the spark plug fires, the little neon lamp fires. So you get a pulse of light. Um, I got the idea for this from my little 
spark plug tester that somebody gave me uh, I think it's it's rolled up it's in my Riley toolkit pretty sure it's in here so when I lived up in Auckland um, the shed I was working on, the little garage, was right on the street. So I'd have the doors open and people would walk past and stop and chat and ask me what I was up to and look at the car. Um, somebody went past one day and they gave me this. And it's a spark plug tester. So it's got a little brass end. You basically stick it on the end of the spark plug terminal and you'll see a little orange flash in there if the um, plug's firing. And that's basically a neon lamp inside there. So that's where I got the idea from. Um, making a neon lamp fire from a spark plug isn't tricky. They, they'll just do it. And then what I have here is a little Arduino microcontroller. And the reason I need that is you need to send the correct pulses to the tachometers to drive them. Um, I'll explain why I've got two in a minute. But what I have here is... The neon lamp is sitting on top of a small light sensor and that just outputs an analog voltage depending on how much light is on it. But the whole thing is covered in black heat shrink. So when the bulb isn't on, there's no light. It blocks all the light. So all I have to do is look for any light from the neon. So it doesn't matter how bright it is, if there's any light at all, I'll see it and I can trigger the circuit. Uh, the rest of the circuitry is just basically to create the pulses you need to drive the tachometers. And it's pretty simple code. It gets a little bit complicated figuring out the frequencies and the, um, and the dividers and multipliers and things you need. So the way you have to think about it is in a four-cylinder engine, when uh, the, the spark plug on each cylinder is firing half the number of revs per minute because it's a four cycle engine so it's doing two revolutions per cycle and there's one firing pulse per cycle so if the engine's doing a thousand rpm you're getting 500 pulses on that spark plug uh, to drive it so what i need to do is figure out how many RPM it is, and then I've got a function in the code in here which um, basically converts that set number of RPM into the right number of pulses to the tachometers. And the tachometers, it, it, the number of pulses you get varies on the number of cylinders in the engine. So that's why they often have little switches on them or settings to, so you can set four, six, eight, one, whatever number of cylinders you've got. Um, I do that all in software. So, what I have, I don't know if we'll be able to see it. One, I have it hooked up to my Austin 7 at the moment because um, it's easy for me to hook onto a spark plug lead and I've got a tachometer in it already that I know is reasonably accurate or as accurate as you need for one of these old vintage cars. So, I don't know if this is going to run very well, but let's see if we can fire it up. <laughs> might be able to see you can see the little pulses Oops. Sorry. so you can see the pulses increase So you won't be getting a true indication. Probably won't be getting a true indication of the pulsing because of the camera and it's the way the rolling shutter works and things like that. But you can see that the you get more pulses the faster the engine goes. That's pretty straightforward. So if we I actually get in the car, uh, these are completely the wrong shoes for driving but just because the engine isn't really warmed up so I need to give it a little bit of throttle to keep it going 
Oh, it's quite hard getting into this with one hand. Here we go. So, what I have here, this is my actual tachometer in the car, hooked to the coil. That's straightforward. Up here, I've got another cheap um, tachometer. This is the one I actually had in this car originally. And this one was the cheapest tachometer I could find online. I think in New Zealand it was $16. Um, because what I'm thinking is if I can make a system that runs with any old tachometer, then you can build your own instrument and use the cheapest mechanism you can to make it work. The interesting thing is this is a traditional coil type instrument, so it moves fairly smoothly. This one um, seems to be using a little stepper motor, which is how I believe most modern cars work. And uh, you can see that when you turn it on, when you apply power to it, it does a sweep like a modern car does. So I can sort of demonstrate how these work, but there's another, a further complication, which is these tachometers, the way I'm doing this, will effectively work a lot more like a, um, like a chronometric tachometer. So the chronometric tachometers, which are mechanical, actually have a clockwork mechanism in them that counts uh, effectively the pulses or the revolutions over a certain amount of time and then displays it via the needle. I believe the normal time for those is 750 milliseconds, three quarters of a second. My software has to behave in a similar way because it needs to be able to count the number of pulses. And for this prototype, I've just got it set to um, count the number of pulses over one second, just because the numbers are easy. It's easy enough for me to change the software to reduce that time. But that means the needles on these are only going to update every second. And then this tachometer has its own delay built in. Um, we can sort of see that. So I've got a potentiometer hooked up here. And if this is on zero, then it reads the, the pulses from the car. But I can simulate pulses to make the needles move. So I can adjust the pot. And you could sort of see the delays. But for a vintage car, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, it actually kind of mimics how some of the older instruments used to work. But you can see that sort of simulating what's going on. But if we set that back to zero and I try to start this thing again. holding about a thousand rpm which does match that gauge as well so that seems to be working um, I would need to make the circuit a lot more robust in terms of noise filtering and things like that. And I have no idea how long a neon lamp will function in this manner. Um, I believe because the current going through it is going to be so low, it should last a very, very long time. Um, I may actually put a large resistor in series with it. They need almost no current to, to spark. So I probably actually do need a really big resistor in series with it now I think about it. Um, so I'm going to try it with that, and if that works, I will um, try hooking it up to the Riley and see if we can start that up and see if it works in that as well. So this should work on any car with a spark plug. Um, or at the moment, the software is only limited to four-cylinder cars, but uh, it would be easy enough to change that. So that seems to be working fairly well. Um, 
I've just noticed a new dent in my Austin. Oh well. Um, yeah, I'm going to try that with a big resistor just so I don't end up killing that neon. Um, even if the neon's burned out, which they shouldn't do, they, they last a very, very, very long time. Um, it would be easy enough to replace it with a new one. They're dirt cheap, they're cents sort of thing, 50 cents a dollar, something like that. So, it's looking promising. So I have this hooked up to the Riley now. I have my little cheapy meter hooked up to it. And I have the my little circuit with the neon indicator hooked up. And I have my electronic meter hooked up and you'll see why these don't work. Uh, it's fine at the moment, but as soon as you start up the car, there's so much electrical noise, it just upsets the meter. So you can see this little cheap gauge. When I attach the power, it runs for a little startup cycle. Does its little sweep. Um, and that sounds very much like a little stepper motor. You can hear it stepping. The reason this one also flicks the needle round is because the way the Arduino works in the software, um, I'm using the PWM output to drive the meter and you have to initialize it with a value and I just happen to be initializing it to a value that drives it halfway around the meter when it starts up. So you kind of get that built-in test that it's working. If I change the startup number that I give it, it'll, it'll, I can make it sweep all the way around. But we should be able to start this up again now. Um, you can see this one's just gone mental. It sometimes works. So that says it's idling around 500, 600. And these both indicate the same. And if I give it a few revs, You can sort of see there that delay because it's sampling over that one second time. Um, I might tweak that to the three quarters of a second that a proper chronometric gauge uses, but um, that seems to be working fairly well. It's, it's really hard to get the exact motion of one of those gauges because being mechanical, they flick backwards so quickly. I can't do that electronically, but this is close enough. Um, it vaguely approximates what's going on and it gives you some idea of the revs. Um, I could definitely make that update time shorter, um, so I could probably make it a half a second, maybe even quarter of a second. Um, you need a certain number of pulses that you detect for it to be accurate, of course. And the number of pulses actually gets quite low as you're going at slower speeds. And that's one of the things I had to build into the software was the neon lamp is actually reasonably slow, so you get like a flash of light, but it's not an immediate on and off like you'd get with an LED. Um, there's a bit of a glow there. So after I detect a flash, I have to not look for any more because otherwise you, you count them, you count the same flash too many times, if that makes sense, because the circuit can run so fast, it'll count, it'll, it'll, it goes around in a loop and it looks to see if there's any light there. So it looks for light, it says yes, count that flash of light, and then it looks again, and it can look so quickly, it can count the same flash of light multiple times. So what you do is when you detect a flash, you delay. And I worked out that um, at 8,000 RPM, I can't remember what the frequency is, but you end up with about 15 microseconds. No, 15 milliseconds between pulses. So that's the the um, the shortest time between pulses I'm ever likely to see. Um, obviously, the Austin 7 or this are not going to run at 8,000 RPM, but that's what my gauges go up to. So that's what I've set as the maximum limit. So the um, the delay means that I only count each pulse once. Um, I didn't actually have that in there when I first 
got this working. And what would happen is the gauges would just get pegged because it was counting pulses multiple times. Um, so that was a, a little trick I had to put in there. Um, I might just go update this, quickly update the software. Uh, the reason I don't have my laptop plugged into it here is because of the danger of electrical noise. So even though this these spark plug leads are isolated, um, you could still get high voltage going into the laptop. So I don't want the laptop anywhere near the high voltage ignition. So um, I've actually got it set up on my lab computer so I can just take this next door, reprogram it, bring it back. Um, if this works reliably, I will need to look at using proper insulated wires for my little pickup wires, um, just so you don't get any arcing or anything from them. Some sort of high voltage wires, maybe Teflon insulated or something like that. But um, yeah, I'll go tweak this to update the, um, to change the update time and make it a bit quicker, make it a bit smoother and see what that looks like. So I have tweaked the software now so that I can put in um, different sample times, which did mean changing some of the numbers around a little bit. Um, most people probably won't know what I'm talking about, but I had to change everything from ins to floats and have multipliers and dividers and things so I can work out the number of pulses as fractions and then multiply and divide as necessary to get the counts right. Um, one of the things you find is because there aren't that many pulses, so I think it's eight pulses per plug per second at a thousand RPM. If you only measure for half a second, you've only got half as many pulses. So your resolution at the lower end of the RPM scale goes down. So the quicker you try to make it, the less pulses you've got to count. So the less accurate you get. So well, not really accuracy, it's sort of resolution. You, you, you lose, um, you lose precision, I guess. Is that the right way to think about it? Uh, and you normally wouldn't get this if you're measuring off the distributor because you've got more pulses to count. So if we power this up. Um, I tweaked it so it just goes up to 1000 on the startup. That meter going all the way around, is, as I said, that's what the meter is doing. Uh, it's not my software doing that. So if we start this up again. So that seems to be working pretty well. Um, I fiddle with the numbers as much as I want to, to try and get different sorts of behavior out of it, but as long as it gives a reasonably accurate indication of revs, I think that's all I need. So my idea was basically getting using these cheap meters. Um, they're easy enough to take apart. They're all just plastic. Uh, it's obviously got its own microcontroller in there, um, which is why it has the behavior it, it does. But I've already figured out you can easily pull the needle off of that and I can just make a new needle and because it's got this flange on the back I can just make my own gauge. Um, all, all I need is a face and I've, I've done that before with the Austin 7 I actually etched a metal panel to make a face so I made it look all vintage and then all you'd need to do is attach that to the back and have a suitable sort of bezel around your, your, your gauge and you can make it look like whatever you want. Um, the other thing I can do, which again means fiddling with the numbers a bit, is I don't have to have it going to 8000. I can effectively scale it so that it goes 0 to 5.5 or whatever is appropriate for the car. Um, or if that can be tweaked in the software. So I think that works pretty well. I think what I need to do is make it a bit more robust and a bit better packaged and um, actually test it out just with a normal meter because fiddling around with the meter physically that's a different problem to getting it to work electrically. So if I can get it all packaged up so I can use a normal tachometer, probably this one on it, um, just to to make sure it is actually going to work properly. 
Um, I also got my big eight inch one, modern one. Um, that should work on here just as well as this one. Um, but I think if I can make sure it's working properly and reliably um, electrically, then it's worth pursuing making a decent meter from it. Uh, it's an interesting little experiment. Like I say, I have no idea how rust, robust this is going to be. Um, it should be fine. Uh, ignore all that circuitry. That was me trying to duplicate what was going on inside there. And I decided because this uses a, a looped wire, I think it's basically a capacitive pickup. Um, I wanted to try something a bit more direct. So, you know, firing a bulb off the spark plug. Uh, I think that's the way to do it. And that's not going to affect the spark at all. Like I say, those neon bulbs take so little current to actually light up. Um, it's not like you're robbing any power from the spark plug or anything like that. So I'm glad that's working as well as it is. It needs a bit more experimentation, but it looks promising.